This is another Eye Raw podcast. Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice where we use books to help think about ways forward through our environmental crisis. Um, we're also a proud member of the Ivor Podcast Network of uh, animal advocacy podcasts. Um, and for the last couple months, as regular listeners know, we've been talking a lot about other animals. Um, today we'll be shifting gears a bit, no pun intended, to an issue that does affect other animals, of course, but we'll start with primarily its impacts on um, humans, and that is uh, the automobile. Today my guest is Daniel Knowles. He is the Midwest correspondent for The Economist, um, and he's the author of the new book, Carmageddon, How Cars Make Life Worse and What to Do About It. Um, we talk about basically what the subtitle says, uh, you know, and what proposed solutions are real and what proposed solutions are maybe more dubious for actually um, solving the issues with our car culture. This is the first in what will be a uh, three or four part series um, where we'll be discussing the issue of cars um, and alternatives from different angles, uh, including their impacts upon non-human animals. Um, but today is kind of a bit more big picture. Uh, I'm recording this intro on a day with very bad air quality, um, in this case due, I think, primarily to wildfires, uh, but still, bad air quality feels fitting uh, when talking about cars. Um, one quick fact-checking note is that uh, Daniel says early on in our interview that cars kill more people in the United States than guns do. Um, cars kill more people than guns used to, but actually both car deaths and gun deaths are on the rise, um, so guns have surpassed cars uh, in recent years, which is not good for guns are cars. Both are now more than 40,000 deaths per year, um, but I guess kind of a depressing on either front fact check note for you. Two quick side notes before we get started. The first is that I have uh, a couple of big written pieces coming out um, soon that I think will be out by the time that this episode goes public, um, so hopefully I'll have the links to put in the episode description. Um, the first is for Sierra Magazine. Um, it's about the uh, carbon problems of aviation, so another transportation-related um, issue. Uh, that I've talked about before on the podcast, um, but I go a little bit deeper in this uh, article for them and kind of start to think about what a future where we fly less looks like, based in part on my own experiences and with trains and buses. And the second is maybe kind of a more experimental uh, essay that's for the relatively new magazine Strange Matters on the ethics and philosophy of extinction and why and how extinction, uh, mass extinctions are, are bad, and looking not at the present example primarily, but looking back at the dinosaurs, um, which as long-time listeners know, uh, or even short time, going back to my Jurassic Park episode a few weeks ago, um, are an interest of mine. So yeah, you can check those out. And then the second uh, final note I wanted to make is that Patreon now allows for uh, seven-day free trials. So... <clears throat> You can sign up for seven-day free trials to take advantage of things like early access to episodes, uh, you know, membership in the book club, information about upcoming episodes, stuff like that. Um, if you want to consider a small monthly donation to this podcast, um, or if you don't, you can always sign up for my uh, free weekly, or at this point it's kind of more bi-weekly newsletter, um, where every other week I'll update you on podcast episodes and my writing and stuff like that. That's probably the best way to keep in touch with me, uh, or follow me on Twitter. All those links are in the episode description. But for now, uh, let's go to Daniel Knowles and talk about Carmageddon. Hi, I'm here with Daniel Knowles, author of Carmageddon, How Cars Make Life Worse and What to Do About It. Um, Daniel, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to go into some more details as the conversation goes on, but just kind of, you know, the 10,000-foot view, uh, you know, Carmageddon, How Cars Make Life Worse is a, um, I think, provocative title, maybe for some, and what, how do cars make lives worse? What, you know, spurred you to write this book? Um, it's a lot of things, and I almost think, you know, I wish I could sum up the book um, in 
kind of so many words because there's lots of different chapters on different aspects of it. But basically what the argument is, is that kind of, you know, we have got to a level in most of the world and are getting to in some parts of it, you know, where everybody expects to drive, where a very large portion of the population have cars and the pollution that they generate, the kind of damage that they do to the environment is enormous. And we kind of know about that, but also they don't make our lives any easier. That's sort of the thrust of it. It's that if you are the only person who has a car, a car makes your life a lot easier. But when everybody's relying on them, the way that we have to redesign our cities and the way in which they kind of change how we live our lives makes just living harder. It makes it harder to get around. It makes it kind of um more expensive um uh, to you know to do anything to live your life it makes our kind of neighborhoods um less friendly um uh, more sprawling more spread out it covers you know huge proportions of 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 our land and tarmac um so there's an awful lot of ways that aren't just you know it pollutes the environment directly although that's pretty bad too so yeah you, you know i think going through those maybe in a little more detail um, one of the issues of is that it not only you know makes it harder to get around, it makes it more dangerous to get around if you're not also in a car, or even if you are also in a car. Um, and a lot of times these traffic collisions are attributed to human error, um, but you point out that road design actually has a lot to do with the the danger of of driving. So so how does that work? Well, right. So if, if you, you know, in, in the United States last year, there was something like 43,000 people killed in car crashes. And the number of people who are run over, you know, as pedestrians or cyclists outside of the vehicle and, and die has been increasing for over a decade now. And, you know, these are big numbers. This is you know, considerably more than the number of people who are killed by guns. And guns, you know, I think rightly a lot of people most in America think are a, a kind of catastrophe how many people are being shot um but suicides and homicides together don't come to as much as cars kill and what happens you know the reason why there are so many deaths it's it's that we have cities and roads are designed in such a way to that encourage you to drive fast and that make it extremely difficult for people who are on foot who are, who are trying to you know get around on bicycles as um, as I do, and I gather you do, um, much scarier because when, you know, when, when a car is moving at, at 40 or 50 miles an hour, if it hits you, you are almost, you know, you're far more likely to die than not. And modern cars are so much heavier as well. So they've got more dangerous. And, and the problem is that I think this, this kind of is one part of what, what the whole book is about is these, kind of ways in which driving and and the use of cars makes life worse for people outside of the cars and also inside them but especially if you're outside of them is that you can get run over you're you're that somebody else's kind of need to move around at 45 miles an hour makes it much harder for you to get around you know without a car safely in any way it's a direct threat to you and uh we call them accidents but accidents you know, if they keep happening, if they're sort of a statistical um, inevitability, then we've designed something wrong. Um, mistakes, pe drivers are going to make mistakes. Those mistakes shouldn't be deadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What are some of the ways that roads are, you know, you, you mentioned the, the idea of a strode. Um, mm. what, what's a strode? So a strode is a road that uh, if you go... Um, you know, you get them in any American city, actually, usually in the outskirts of cities, sometimes right in the middle. But a strode is somewhere that's halfway between a, well, a road and a street. It's both for moving traffic down fast from getting from one place to another, but it's also lined with businesses and, um, you know, housing and places that people need to be and places that you might walk between. Um, so it has crosswalks and it has, um, you know, sidewalks it has places for people to walk, but it also has you know, maybe eight lanes or 10 lanes of traffic. Um, and the cars are going down at 40 or 50 miles an hour. And this has become the kind of predominant form of like urban development 
in large parts of America. And if you look at where kind of the most pedestrians are killed in car crashes, it's these sorts of roads, these roads. You get a lot of them in, in Florida, in Texas, in places where the cities have grown up kind of recently, whereas the oldest cities in this country, um, places, you know, like Manhattan or um, you know, central Philadelphia or, um, Washington DC. The, the places that were kind of built before car ownership became, you know, completely, uh, universalized. They have the lowest kind of death rates. And so basically we designed roads that were safer before we had highway engineers. Highway engineers came in and went, okay, great. We're going to, you know, have apply science to road building. And they made roads that are much less safe, which people die on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things you point out is that these wider roads where people go faster, um, you know, a fast moving car is so much more dangerous than a slow moving car, um, so much more likely to kill or seriously injure. Um, and bigger cars are also more likely to kill or injure than smaller cars. Um, yet we're we're trending upward. Uh, how how serious is this trend of, of bigger cars? Oh, it's bad. Uh, I mean, it's bad on so many levels, you know, um, if you look at just individual models of cars, like, um, you know, I was recently, I had to rent a car, I had a Toyota RAV4, and um, it's a car that I mentioned in the book, the RAV4, because it's grown something like the latest versions 40% since the kind of original RAV4 was introduced into the market in the 80s or 90s, I can't remember exactly when, but, um, and, you know, if you look at the vehicles that you see on on streets, um, particularly here in the US, but actually this has happened, you know, in large parts of the world. Vehicles have got a lot larger. Um, yeah, you've got these these huge heavy pickup trucks, these um, uh, huge SUVs, and there's a, and this really is what I keep coming back to in the book, and I think is the key thing is that 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 you know it applies to environment. The environment applies to that. These are kind of structural problems where. If you are on a road, it, it's a collective action problem. If you are on a road and you're sharing the road with, with other vehicles and you're driving even, the bigger the vehicles that everybody else is in, the bigger you want your own vehicle to be in. Because otherwise, if you get hit, you're going to get squashed and crunched. Um, a small vehicle will always come out worse than a collision with a big one. It's just physics and so there's this essentially this arms race where people are getting bigger and bigger vehicles in part because it's the only way to feel safe when they're on roads full of bigger and bigger vehicles and you know and that kind of applies to everything people are driving because everybody else is driving and so the network's built up to drive essentially everything forces you to make these decisions that are incredibly environmentally destructive dangerous and expensive you know to you but that that's just you're, you're forced into the into that this it's very difficult for any individual to sort of you know, to, to 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 detach themselves from these kind of social pressures mm -hmm. And and then another uh, another way that you highlight um, in how cars are damaging cities is parking, um, and maybe that's overlooked. And, and people on the surface, you know, we like having easy access to parking if we have to drive somewhere. Um, but the you know mandated parking minimums have actually been extremely damaging. You point out how why is, why is this? Well, if you go to any particularly small town America, actually, you know, towns are mostly parking. Um, they, restaurants that, you know, a, a restaurant that requires, say, a parking spot for every diner or like, two parking spots for every table, there are often rules like that. You know, it ends up being more parking than it is restaurants and uh, by a large scale. And so you have these, I think par parking and road building and car dependency, they all sort of go together in land use, basically. And in terms of the kind of environmental impact, I think a thing that's not appreciated is that it's not only the direct um, impact of the CO2 that your car is producing that is kind of warming the planet um you know all the direct impact of of the emissions you know the kind of local emissions that your car is producing it's also that when everybody's driving we um 
have so much land that is devoted to parking and to storing those cars and to the roads to move between them that everything has to be spread out and the more spread out everybody's living the harder it is to get around on foot or by bicycle and the more energy we're using for everything else you know for deliveries for uh you know the amount of sewage lines between places the amount of electricity and so people who live in very sprawling neighborhoods you know and and kind of huge large houses with their own plot large plots of land are also using way more energy heating those houses or cooling them in the summer than people who live in kind of denser cities and so you know the the there's this kind of second order environmental impact of car dependency that's way more dramatic than just a direct effect of how much uh, kind of co2 that's being produced by cars and um uh which we don't talk about and that and that's linked to the amount of parking to the amount of road space that we have to just how much we reformulate everything around our cars um so somebody in texas produces three times as much co2 as somebody living in new york city and the vast majority of that is just because everything's farther apart rather than because you know of the direct impact of their car driving so yeah that i yeah i, I agree that that is sort of a an overlooked thing and, and maybe what we'll get to later um about why we you know it's it's not a complete solution to just replace every current car with an electric car although you know it'd be better but it doesn't solve all these other problems um but before we get there uh i i want to highlight um one of the things you emphasize which is just that there wasn't necessarily anything inevitable about the fact that our streets our land use our cities came to be dominated by cars and not by pedestrians or bikes um they used to be dominated by pedestrians you know 100 plus years ago um, and that there were city planners and traffic engineers who made decisions to prioritize cars, prioritize parking. Um, what what are kind of one or two of the key historical moments um, that when pedestrians begin to lose this battle? Well, I think, you know, if you go back, they're still losing this battle in large parts of the world. But yeah, as you said, it goes back 100 years. And I think, you know, I, the, in the book, I, I go through the history in several chapters. And I, I begin it with um, uh, the, the very beginning of the motor age, the end of the 19th century, um, where in, in the UK, actually, we used to have these laws where when motor cars first appeared, there were these laws that treated them as traction locomotives and said that, you know, to move down a street you had to have a man waving a red flag going in advance and a speed limit of i think four or five miles an hour maybe even lower and the one of the great the first kind of moments was the undoing of this um uh the the uh, new a uh, new law passed that allowed um drivers to you know to suddenly kind of drive free without the the speed limit or the uh the man in front and and um if you read The Wind in the Willows, um, which I talk about in the book, it, it's kind of around the same time it was happening in the US, you had these kind of very, you know, cars were very much rich people and, and pleasure vehicles, but they be, that's when they began to, to the, this idea of, you know, the motor vehicle has priority on the road and going at, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour along a, a country road is, you know, you're, you're right as a motorist. And really that then kind of moved in the, the, in the US, in the, the, the post First World War period in 1920s and 1930s, that's when you had cars begin to take over city streets. And as that happened, you know, that was not uh, sort of accidental. That took, there was a lot of fighting over that. There were a lot of, there were protests at the number of of people particularly of children being run over and killed by cars um there were these huge demonstrations and organizations and attempts to ban cars from from city streets or to limit their speed to control them and and essentially a car lobby grew up and, and fought back um and quite successfully you know funded their own campaigns and they got laws on jaywalking ban passed so you were banned from just walking in the street you had to use the crossroad so there was this kind of process over really 50 years or so um whereby cars were 
given the right, the kind of right of way, the domain over so much of the, the space that we, that we live in over pedestrians, over people on bikes, over, you know, animals, um, horse and carts, whatever. Um, that was not this instant thing that I think is being mostly forgotten about. Um, it's just taken for granted that cars appeared and, you know, almost like cell phones, suddenly everybody had one, but no, it took, it took a, a whole, uh, a lot of effort by organized, you know, motor, they used to call themselves motordom by people to, to, to get to this, this, this space that we now live in where cars have priority everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and now a lot of the world is kind of going through their own similar transition. Um, you, you know, you're from the UK, you live in the U S now. Um, but you also spend some time in the book um, on the rest of the world, including the global south, where car use is, is now on the rise. And on the one hand, you know, it's it's only fair that if we get to drive around as much uh, as we do, you know, everyone should have, you know, we who are we to tell someone else not to drive so much? Um, but but there's also some some concerning elements about how cars are rising across the globe. Um, what What is so concerning about this? Well, I think it's not appreciated, actually, when we talk about car dependency, that, that, that we are still at an early stage. If you look at most of the planet, you know, most of the world, people don't own cars. Um, there are something like 1.5 billion cars in the world, you know, for a population of seven something or 8 billion now. Um, and if if the kind of the rest of the world is going to get towards, you know, American or even European levels of car ownership, we are, that we are talking three or four times as many vehicles on the roads as now as, as, as we have. And I used to live in Kenya. Um, and after that in Mumbai in India and, um, you know, in both of those countries in India and in Kenya, you have very low levels of car ownership. And yet the way the cities are being built out, you know, the way Nairobi has grown and Nairobi has grown from, you know, kind of a town of two or 300,000 people at independence, maybe less than that, even to four or 5 million now in its kind of urban area, it's done so over, um, on roads and on cars driven by, the relatively small kind of upper middle class and, and elite in those countries that, that want cars and that uh, have taken their cue from, you know, from, from richer countries that sort of car driven lifestyles are, are desirable and pleasant and they, they, they're sprawling out and there's really, it's really, really difficult to find a city, you know, in the, the developing world where kind of car ownership is not soaring and congestion and car deaths you know a million people across the world at least are killed just in car crashes every year and, and an order of magnitude more than that by by the pollution and I, I think it's not appreciated enough quite how fast the the car is like spreading in india in in africa and and, and how polluting and damaging these are and for the vast majority of people they can't afford to drive but they're suffering the consequences of the you know the 10 percent who can afford to drive um who are often driving these second-hand vehicles that are exported from europe or from america or from japan uh you know that are polluting so much and it's um just directly the air quality and 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 we're not going to electrify those vehicles anytime quickly um so there's a kind of the the way that cars are talked about the way that um planning is talked about we it's as though america sometimes particularly in this country it's as though the entire world borders stop at the edge of the united states and they don't mm -hmm. yeah it, it seems to me um you know the the model of the middle upper class good life should be one that is actually attainable by you know that everyone could live that way and it wouldn't be an utter disaster um but right. the the car dependent good life is one that kind of relies on not everyone doing it um, exactly and i think this is something that you know actually if you look at some of where some of the wealthiest people in in the country and in, in the world live and want to live it is you know the upper east side of manhattan it's um 
Kensington, Chelsea in London. It's the you know centre of Paris. All of the places that you can have quite sustainable lifestyles. You can live in a, you know, maybe if you're really rich, you live in a big condo, but it's still a condo that's kind of a shared building that uses, you know, shares its like heating and, and cooling with other buildings. So it's efficient. Um, it, where you, you know, you can walk. And, and unfortunately, the irony is that, that the less sustainable kind of, um, lifestyle, uh, which is, you know, the huge house in the suburbs or the countryside with, you know, your whole family having a car each um that's become the more financially attainable lifestyle whereas like living a kind of you know a, a prosperous um urban existence um you know where you have a like a nice family sized apartment and you can walk to work and you can kind of you know take a subway to work and you know walk around your neighborhood and you've got everything the 15 minute city thing like that is ought to be in terms of the resources it uses and and uh the more sustainable kind of um way to live that ought to be possible for everybody but for some kind of insane way we have made that the financially expensive way to live we've made that the difficult way to live because we just haven't built many cities or many neighborhoods where you can live like that so the ones that, that we have are kind of incredibly fought over and meanwhile you know you can go and buy a gigantic house in the middle of sort of nowhere where you have to drive a hundred miles you know every day just for sort of your daily life for really not that much money Mm -hmm. yeah you (coughs) you mentioned how kind of mid-century it was uh you know the more affluent and in particular white people um kind of fled the cities to to have that kind of car dependent suburban lifestyle and often in ways that explicitly barred it from being accessible to um, black people and and people of color. Um, But, but yeah, that it's sort of switched that what is the desirable um, place to live a bit. Right. Uh, I mean, you're in Detroit, which is a, you know, a classic example of somewhere. I mean, the classic example, the whole chapter in the book about it, because it's a city i visited often and, but, and, and, but a city that, you know, with it living memory was 2 million people, um, densely populated and, and people did get around, you know, you could get around by streetcar and, and, you know, on, on foot and, and they just tore out the whole neighborhoods, um, to put these incredibly fast roads through, um, it just, you know, enabled, in fact, encouraged essentially um, for racialized reasons, the destruction of of this public infrastructure and the spreading out of of the the relative, you know, the rich, the, the essentially white people, out into um, these kind of neighborhoods where they then had to commute thirty or forty miles back into the city, and leaving behind, you know, the poorest, who of course were almost all black, because such was the racialized kind of nature of poverty and of in, in America that that. Um, uh, unable to get around their own city anymore because of, all the infrastructure had been taken out. Um, and it's just catastrophic. And, and I think the point of the book is that it was sort of, you know, this self-interest put ahead of collective interest has made everybody worse off. And cars really are just this enormous collective action problem. They're this terrible prisoner's dilemma where we've all acting in our own individual interests made ourselves much worse off. So if cars are the problem, um, maybe let's talk about solutions. Um, one of the things I appreciate in the book is that you go through um, and kind of, you know, debunk what are some fake or at least incomplete solutions um, that have been proposed to problems like congestion or sprawl or pedestrian deaths or environmental impact. Um, and so, yeah, I thought we could sort of bounce through what doesn't work, uh, and what does eventually. (laughs) Um, so maybe, you know, people may have heard of this idea of induced demand, but if the streets are crowded with traffic, why don't we just make the roads wider? Ah, well, um, because people use them. Um, I mean, it's more, that's essentially what the induced demand argument is. I think the problem widening roads is that you know you build it they will come and the more you widen roads a the harder you make it to for other forms of 
you know, people, uh, the wider a road is, the harder it is to cross it on foot, the harder it is to use, but, pe- but the, the people will turn to driving because driving is very comfortable and it's very convenient. And, you know, as an individual, that is. Um, and, uh, you know, you get to sit in your own kind of climate controlled metal box, listening to your own music and go along. And so the easier we make it, the more people will do it. But the, the problem with that is that they're turning away from, you know, from, from alternatives, um, that then become less viable. The more people are driving, the less viable public transport becomes, the more everything spreads out. And gradually you, the road is widened to a point that everybody starts switching to driving, that the traffic is bad, as bad as it was before, except that now you don't have any public transport. You don't have anybody walking or cycling. They can't anymore because everything's spread out. So you're back to where it was before. You've, you've made it easier to drive, but suddenly everything's further apart and you've cancelled out all of the gains of making it easier to people to move around because they're just going further with each journey. Um, so essentially, beyond a certain point that we are well past in the rich world, um, widening the roads doesn't help. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't benefit in terms of helping people move around. It's extremely expensive. And the way you can kind of show that, that it doesn't help, that it's not worth it, is that there are loads of cases in America, actually not just in America, I wrote about a case in the UK as well with motorway, but where governments have widened roads or in or built new roads to relieve traffic congestion. And then they've put a toll on the road to... um essentially say, well, we're going to pay for, you know, we need to pay back for, for building and widening this road. Um, and people don't use it because they don't want to pay a dollar or two dollars or whatever it is. You know, they don't want to pay the toll to not sit in traffic. And so it turns out that actually, you know, we spend highway agencies and governments will spend a fortune widening roads to help drivers move a little bit faster. But the drivers, they won't pay that money. Um, so we're all paying for it, the general taxpayer, to help people drive more when they don't want to pay for it themselves. And when probably, actually, if you just change the incentives a bit, they would travel some other way and appreciate it. Mm-hmm. So if it doesn't work to make the roads wider, what if we make the roads underground? Uh, I hear Elon Musk is going to build a lot of tunnels, and that is going to help <laughs> Well, right. I mean, you know, a buried road is probably better than a non-buried road in terms of, you know, it's like if you bury the road, you're not going to destroy as many people's homes and at least you'll be able to walk over the top of it. But it costs a fortune. Tunneling is the most extraordinarily expensive um, activity. And if we could tunnel as cheaply or as easily as Elon Musk thinks, then, you know, we would have done incredible things to, to public transport. We would have new railway lines, um, you know, in every city in America that, that we haven't built. But in, in reality, tunneling is extraordinarily expensive and extraordinarily difficult. Um, you know, if you look at the Second Avenue tunnel in New York City, um, that's being built, um, to add a few subway stops, it's in the, it's, it's billions and billions of dollars. And so the idea that we're going to kind of do that work only to shove cars down these tunnels and that we could have enough tunnels ever to kind of take on the amount of vehicles necessary while solving congestion. It's insane. The maths don't make sense. It's impossible. Like I'm all for tunneling, but if we're going to tunnel, we should put trains through them because you can move a lot more people per minute on trains just a lot more people just everything with cars comes back to the fact they just occupy so much space Mm -hmm. um so speaking of musk um electric cars are in a lot of ways um far superior to gas-powered cars um but there are problems with just trying to replace you know every gas-powered vehicle with an equivalent electric one the you know the the clear one that we've talked about is that it wouldn't get rid of you know all the space cars take like electric cars still need parking they still need um road space and and stuff like that um but you there's a couple other i want to bring up so you, you talk about uh cobalt mining for one what's what's the mm. situation there well so cobalt is um this very key ingredient that goes in um batteries pretty much all lithium batteries. Um, and over half of the world's supply of cobalt is in one country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I wrote and about 
Congo a lot in my previous job when I was based in Africa and I visited Congo for this book because I think, you know, it's long been the case that kind of cobalt has been mined in Congo and fed in batteries and before cobalt copper. Um, uh, but, uh, the, the, the cobalt boom that sort of elect the electric car industry has set off has been enormous. And, and at the point where I visited, it was really, kind of insane. I think, you know, the cobalt prices were, were off the charts and um, people were, you know, every hillside in, in Kowesi, which is this city in southern Congo, um, was kind of getting stripped by artisanal miners. By And it, it's this, the mining of cobalt, it happens in, in there are two ways, basically. There is um, people who um, are there are industrial companies, big kind of um, rich companies that that mine most of it, and then there are um, people who are literally with pickaxes and you know kind of shovels digging it out themselves and selling it. And 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 I write about both in the book, and they both they both have huge downsides. You know, the artisanal uh, mining is uh, very unsafe. Um, it sometimes involves child labour, but the industrial mining, which is you know. But if you buy a Tesla, where your your the um, battery, the cobalt in the battery for your Tesla has come from is an industrial mine, it's not really much better because it kind of props up this appalling, um, corrupt government that for sixty or seventy years, you know, and, and really hundred years or more actually, if we go through the period of Belgian colonialism, has just exploited Congolese people, and I think that. And the environmental damage done is enormous, you know, rivers polluted, um, uh, the, the, the costs, the, the kind of environmental costs of, of, of building, you know, the billion or more electric cars that we will need to replace every car are, they are not unsubstantial, essentially. And, and I, and I think that we do need to electrify our cars, but we also need to reduce the number of cars really an awful lot to, to minimize that. And, and unfortunately, the way that we are electrifying is being offered as a, an alternative to reducing the number of cars as opposed to a complement, at least in a lot of countries. I think it's a kind of cop out. Um, yeah, some places are doing it well, like Norway is electrifying their cars, but they're also getting rid of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another just kind of small tidbit in the book, but that was somewhat depressing is that um uh conventional car companies are buying all these credits from tesla um that basically allow them to use tesla's carbon savings as an excuse to emit more can you well, right. explain how that works so there's been a lot of um reporting pointing out um since the united nations i think did it that that the number of electric cars on the roads um, have created and the, the carbon that they have sort of reduced has been more than countered by the growth of very heavy polluting vehicles, particularly SUVs. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that this is not just sort of coincidence. This is by design, because the way in both Europe and the US um, car emissions are regulated is essentially by what they call kind of fleet averages. So essentially, if you're a car manufacturer, you have to produce vehicles that have an average fuel economy of, I think in the US, it's something, it might have gone up actually under, I think it's something like 38 miles to the gallon. Um, but of course, if you sell an electric car, which has the equivalent kind of fuel economy in terms of its emissions of, you know, 150 miles to the gallon, um, then you can suddenly sell a whole bunch more polluting vehicles, you know, with a mileage of 20, um, to, uh, kind of, and, and still hit that average. So every electric car basically enables the sale of a big SUV that, you know, is nowhere near 38 miles to the gallon. And, you know, but a lawful lot of new cars sold in the US now have mileages of, you know, 18 to 22 miles to the gallon, you know, if they're pickup trucks. Um, so, and the way this worked with Tesla, you know, for a long time and, and still now, I mean, Tesla are now grown enough that it's not the only way they're making profit. But for a long time, their their biggest source of revenue wasn't selling the cars directly. It was selling emissions um, uh passes to other manufacturers um it was the whole of their profit in 2021 i believe um because they for every tesla they sold they were able to sell a bunch of emissions credits to other manufacturers for huge sums of money um 
So, you know, the early adopters of Tesla at least basically enabled the sale of a bunch more, um, I, you know, Ford excursions. Um, and I don't think people have realized that that's structurally built in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I don't know. It seems like there's got to be a better way to design regulations than that. Um, yeah. And I think that will change um, because I think people are aware of that, but it's a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that process actually of the new rules is being worked through right now. Um, but it's, that's how it's worked for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, so another thing that's supposed to help, um, are self-driving cars because, you know, they're supposed to be safer, reduce collisions. Uh, they can drive closer together, some say, so they can reduce congestion. You introduced this concept from, uh, well, you can tell me who it's from, but um, <laughs> called Bionic Duckweed, uh, which I, yeah, I thought, you know, I do a lot of climate environmental journalism and I wish I'd known about this concept before because it's super <laughs> useful. So what is Bionic Duckweed? So Bionic Duckweed came from, and I'm afraid, at the top of my head, I can't remember the, the name of the man, but the idea came in initially from this um, railway engineer in the UK about 10, 15 years ago, who was being interviewed by Parliament and um, said, why, you know, why do, are we not investing in our railways? Why, you know, and, and he said, well, there's this constant idea of you come up with uh, uh, in, in, it could be that in, he was like, we're not electrifying our railways because in 20 years time, maybe somebody will invent a way of, of having developing hydrogen from duckweed, um, bionic duckweed. And so we'll have cheap hydrogen. And so we won't need to electrify our railways to reduce the CO2, you know, from diesel engines. Um, essentially, bionic duckweed is this idea that that uh, some future technology is just over the horizon that will solve all of your problems in this really easy way. So we don't need to invest in um the difficult kind of complicated solution that we have available now. So literal bionic duckweed is the idea of super cheap hydrogen will mean that we don't need to electrify everything. Um, and as a kind of metaphor, it's this idea of, you know, we will, yeah, we'll invent something, you know, technology will solve all of our problems. And sometimes technology does solve our problems. But if you look at kind of automatic uh, sorry not automatic cars if you look at um, self-driving cars um they have become a kind of excuse to not change our transport systems it's like oh well you know congestion will be solved because um self-driving cars will you know all be much more efficient and they so they won't block intersections and they will be able to follow each other perfectly closely because they'll be connected and break in unison so they won't need stopping distance and they won't ever crash into anybody because they'll be able to recognize a human instantly at any speed and so essentially that that self-driving cars will solve all of our problems and so we don't need to invest in public transport and actually it'd be stupid for us to invest in public transport because in you know a few years time everybody will have their own an instant self-driving taxi that will take them anywhere for, for free um, or for nearly free and essentially what I argue in the book is that this is nonsense I think that self-driving cars will become more and more of a reality but they will have basically the same problems as, as um, you know as traditional cars um, they will still occupy space and people and the worry that I have about them is that people will use them more because they, if they do so to the extent that they do solve problems, they will become that they are easier and cheaper. Then we'll have loads of them. So that will kind of um, the amount of you know of cobalt that we've got to put in all their batteries, and the amount of um, uh, electricity we need to power them, assuming they're electrically powered, is going to be more. The more energy we have to generate. Um, the more our cities will sprawl out to accommodate them and the more problems will continue. So I just think it's a sort of, it's not that I think the technology is completely fake. I just think that it's not going to solve all of our problems at all. And by pretending that it will, it's, we generate an excuse not to, to do what we should be doing. And I, uh, I opened the book and the railway engineer's name is Roger Ford. So, ah, where it's yes. um, <laughs> so yeah, we've talked about some things that aren't, uh, necessarily going to solve the problem on their own, um, but let's turn to things that might, uh, you know, more substantively help. Um, you talk about Tokyo as a model that other cities might look to. 
What, what's Tokyo getting right? So the reason I talked about Tokyo is because I actually don't, Japan hasn't got this reputation as being a super green, you know, super sort of environmentalist place. You know, they have lots of industry. They have, so have kind of coal power plants, that kind of thing. But actually quietly they are. And it goes back, you know, long before anybody was really heavily concerned about climate change. They built their cities in a way that didn't encourage car use because, well, partly because they didn't, they couldn't afford the road building. You know, Japan in the advent of World War Two was was quite poor. But they, so in 1957, go back to parking. They made they passed a law that made it um, on street parking illegal. Um, overnight on street parking illegal, pretty much in the whole country. Um, so if you want to own a car in Japan, um, you have to own a parking space, and to buy the car, you have to show the police that you, um, you know, that you have access to a parking space for it, and, and obviously that's expensive. Um, it's particularly expensive in a big city like Tokyo. Um, as well as that, they, you know, they have tolls on all of their expressways, which are among the highest in the world, paid for the roads, um, and. They have this incredible kind of railway infrastructure, which is profitable. And it's profitable because the cars aren't subsidized. And so, you know, people, a lot of Japanese people still have cars, but they drive them far less than people who own cars in, in Europe or in, in America. They, the car is something that you have available for when you, you really need it. Um, you know, for when you do have to haul something heavy or you are picking up an elderly relative or whatever it might be, but because it's, you know, because you're in Japan, you're basically paying the real cost of, of running that car. You're not being subsidized by government giving you free land to park it and to drive it on. You only use it when you really need to. And otherwise you use the trains or you go on your bike or you walk. And, and so Japan has among, or, or Tokyo rather, has among the, the lowest car use of any rich world city. Um, and so I think there, there are some huge lessons to be taken from that, which, which is that, and one of them, I think, is that, you know, while I'm fully in favor of subsidizing public transport, it, if we want people to use their cars less, we have to, unfortunately, we have to make it harder for them to use them. We can't keep subsidizing vehicles, um, and then going, oh, look, here's a train as well, but, but we're going to, you know, make it free for you to drive, or, you know, encourage you to drive. And I think, unfortunately, that's what we've been, been, been doing. So my, my kind of lessons from Tokyo is that, that you, you do need to make driving a bit trickier and that ultimately people will thank you for it in the long run. Um, but, uh, yeah, we need to get people out of their cars and then, and then we can rebuild our cities. And the other, another thing that's noticed about Tokyo, very relative terms, affordable housing that's been becoming, you know, fam historically very expensive to live in Tokyo, but it's been, been becoming cheaper and cheaper over time because they don't use up all their land with car parking space and roads. So they've been building housing and they build a lot of housing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, another more optimistic chapter you have is about um, biking. And, you know, you said you bike a lot of places. I bike um, as much as I can. Um, what, what role can, how serious a role can bikes play in, in getting people out of their cars? So I think bikes are already playing a role in getting people out of their cars, and particularly electric bikes. One thing that I have heard repeatedly living here in Chicago is anecdotally, you know, I meet parents who have bought e-bikes and they buy them specifically because of the, the, the pickup of your kids from school. And, um, you know, a lot of American schools, I'm, I'm not a parent, but you know, I'm at that age where an awful lot of my friends are, you know, it's a daily part of people's lives is going to, to part in, in a car, you know, two or three miles to a daycare center or a school and queuing for 20, 30 minutes, you know, in a queue of like smoggy traffic to pick up your kid. Um, and, uh, what I've been hearing is, you know, parents have realized oh, I can get a, a cargo bike with a child seat zoom to the front of the um of the queue pick up my kid uh put him on the back of the the bike and be be home again you know in half the time that i would have taken in the car and it's greener and cheaper and quieter and and so i think subtly you know and i met people in like the suburbs of chicago have told me this um more than one like several and so um i think bikes kind of promise they actually deliver on the sort of you know point to point free, easy, reliable transport that, that cars are meant to deliver without the downsides. They use 
you know, if they're electric bikes, they use a fraction of the energy. They use a fraction of the world's resources um, to make and to build. Um, you know, one kind of electric bike battery is something like 500 Tesla. Oh, sorry, sorry, 500. To, um, you get 500 bike batteries as one Tesla battery or something. Um, and, uh, and, and they get you, you in, in urban areas, you get around really quite quickly on them. Um, so... The main reason why I think why people aren't cycling more and why they don't bike is that it's scary and it's dangerous because of the cars and cities that have been making it easier to bike and making it safer to bike. And I, I wrote about Paris um, in the book, but but London has also done this. Um, Amsterdam has done it. Actually, Minneapolis is a place that, you know, has done it that you might not expect. Um, when they do that, uh, when it becomes when you have safe cycle routes, a lot of people the same way as induced demand, widening a road encourages people to drive. Um, creating a bike lane encourages people to bike, and and they will. Um, so and I, I kind of think that electric bikes, because you can do five or six miles on an electric bike and not even break a sweat, and you know as fast as you can drive it in a lot of places. You know if you're doing twenty miles an hour, certainly somewhere like Chicago, um, you know they they can compete with cars. Um, uh, on the individual basis as well, and they don't have the social costs. So I have a lot of hope for bikes. I think that politically speaking as well, they're one of the things that we can really do that, you know, not so challenging as raising gas taxes, which I would obviously love to do, but I think it's not going to happen. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you mentioned Minneapolis being somewhat surprising. I, you know, I'm in Detroit now. I used to live in Chicago. That's where you live. These are places that get cold in winter. Um, but you, you know, I think you maybe briefly mentioned the book, like it's actually, you can still, you know, if you're, if you're able, if you're, you know, able to bundle up, you can, it's not like the roads are snowed out most of the time, even in winter. Um, you know, it's, it's doable to be at least partially an all year biker, even in some of these places. I drive cycling in Chicago. I have, I've been here, you know, through two winters now and I, have only had a couple of days, I think, where there's been so much snow on the roads that I felt like I can't really bike. Um, and I, you know, and I, they've been quite mild winters, but I've been, I've cycled all the way through. Um, but I gather in Minneapolis and I, I think Detroit as well, it snows more. You know, if, if it, you live somewhere where it snows in the same way that if you're a driver, you get snow wheels. Um, you know, if you're a cyclist, you can get snow tires for your, for your bike, which are studded. And I've met cyclists in Minneapolis, I hadn't in Detroit, but who, you know, who cycle all through winter, even on blizzards, even kind of through the snow, because it's fine. And uh, the irony is that, you know, whenever I hear this kind of thing of, oh, well, you know, it's cold weather. Have you seen what happens to cars when there's a blizzard? You know, one of Chicago's kind of great moments in history was, I think, was it 1977? A huge blizzard um, uh, when... Um, uh, where, you know, thousands of, of people were stranded, you know, for days in their cars. Um, um, because cars are actually really bad in the snow. I've like sat outside, um, 1967, not 1977, you know, and tens of thousands of people were stranded, um, in their cars, uh, in a blizzard. And, and I, I've sat and looked out my window and watched people, you know, really struggling to get their cars out of a snowdrift. Um, so cars, yeah, you know, cars are only, this kind of convenient way to travel in really bad weather because we spend a fortune, you know, gritting the roads and, and plowing them um, and clearing them so that cars can get through and a fortune on, you know, maintaining our vehicles. Uh, not that I have a car, but, but people spend a fortune maintaining their vehicles, you know, having snow tires, all the rest of it. And it still doesn't work that well. So it's kind of nonsense, this idea that, oh, you know, cars are actually the convenient way to work in, in you know, big wintry cities. They're not. They're maybe just a bit more comfortable because you have, you know, because you don't have to get out in the cold yourself but you get a good jacket like i mean come on we, we can go outside can't we we can we can wear you know we can we can bundle up we can wear layers we're not that dumb <laughs> uh yeah and is there uh you know are there any other examples of um maybe u.s cities that have put in some successful policies or cultural trends or any any other steps in the right direction you want to highlight before we go? Well, I mean, right now, you know, New York City is finally getting congestion pricing. It's, you know, the federal government has just 
after God knows how long waiting, decreed that, that there will be no environmental impacts, which is funny because actually there'll be a very positive environmental impact. Um, but uh, it, it's kind of bonkers it required that process. But, you know, but New York City, I think, you know, is obviously somewhere, it's the only big city in America where a vast, a large majority of people don't drive to work and don't own cars um but i think has been improving enormously but, um you know but there's good things happening in a lot of places i mean you know um one thing that's been really striking to me is in california all these laws have been passing um to change the rules um parking um so that in uh um particularly places where there is access to public transport you're allowed to build more housing you're allowed to build apartments you don't have to supply you know one and a half parking spaces for every apartment, um, which is often what the law requires now, which just requires so much land that it makes it very expensive to build that housing. So I think there's there's a growing recognition actually at the moment of the costs, particularly in you know the direct the the indirect costs that that relying on our cars impose on us, how it makes our lives more expensive, um, that are spreading. Yeah, in, in a lot of America, I think, yeah, you know, the stuff that's happening in California in some ways is more inspiring because, precisely because, because, you know, we think of California as being such a classically automotive place and they're trying quite hard to make it not. Mm-hmm. Um, is there, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I mean, I, I don't think so. We've sort of, we've d- kind of discussed the whole thing. I think that, I think I'll just, I'll give you a kind of a concluding summary and so you can cut everything where it's just umming and ahhing um <laughs> but so i think you know one thing i wanted to get across in in this this book um is that it's not that individual drivers are bad people and it's not that cars you know an individual car is the most appalling invention you know it's not a nuclear bomb i, I think cars can be useful the argument though is that we are creating a world deliberately which takes away other choices it takes away alternatives the more cars we have the harder it is to do anything else and so they're the opposites of freedom and i think you know so far as there's been a backlash i think there is always this backlash of why aren't you letting me do this thing that i've always been able to do in in my car why can't i drive through this road and i think we sometimes need to reframe the debate to be well hang on a minute why shouldn't I be able to get to work on my bicycle without feeling like I'm going to be, you know, squashed under the wheels of somebody in an F-150 if I make a, you know, if he makes a mistake or I make a mistake. It's, there's, cars have taken away our freedom because we have so many of them. And so I think my argument is partly it's about bringing it back. I, I'm glad you ended on that. I briefly considered starting the podcast by asking you, why you hate freedom because so much of the pop culture around cars is, you know, the open road and, uh, you know, leaving home and going on a trip. Um, I mean, I have a whole spiel, which is the, like the conservative case for, for getting rid of cars and like why cars raise your taxes as well. So I've got like different pitches for different audiences. Um, well, yeah, actually my, uh, I, a lot of pop culture has been pro car, but the the next episode I'm going to release is about how science fiction depicts cars, and oh, it's actually amazing. often uh, historically been kind of critical of of cars and associated cars with sort of a dangerous tech right. um, and a surprising amount of uh, sci sci fi heroes on bikes that I'm going to talk about with. Uh, an English professor, Jeremy Withers, um, but that'll be oh, out. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's great. I'll, I'll listen to that. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm counter Jeremy. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, great. Well, yeah, so um, but that's next, but this episode was Daniel Knowles on his book, Carmageddon. Uh, thanks so much. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. That was Daniel Knowles on Carmageddon. By the time uh, you're listening to this, if you are listening to the free public version, um, then probably that next episode I mentioned on cars and science fiction is now available um, to Patreon subscribers. So if you get the free trial of Patreon, uh, you can just hop in and listen to that episode early if you like. And then, of course, you can always hop out before it actually charges you. Um, If you're listening to this episode early because you already are a Patreon subscriber, thank you for uh, keeping this podcast going. I wouldn't have done the second season without you. Um, And 
you probably cannot listen right away <laughs> to the next episode, but I promise I'll get it to you as soon as I can. As a quick reminder uh, to those of you who are new, um, we also have a book club for Patreon subscribers that is monthly-ish, um, and you can see a link in the episode description for more info on that, what our best, what our next book club is, when the Zoom discussion will be, etc. Thanks so much for listening, as always, and hope you have a great day. Hi. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com. Ah!